if yeah. I were if I were uh, Taylor. Yeah, that's just yeah exactly. You know, so he's gonna get a couple better hands to fold, I think. Yeah. Um, very reasonable shove from Rex there. Unfortunate that his active opponent had it. Jesse here, eight seven of diamonds on the button. Gets to play back to back buttons. Harrison going to defend King 7, so he's in a dominating position here. But he is outflopped on the 10, 8, 4, two clubs and a diamond board. Pretty good looking flop for Jesse. Pair, backdoor flush draw, backdoor straight draw. I would anticipate that he'll just bet here, but he's also on that awkward stack size where he doesn't want to play a lot of big pots unless he can just semi-bluff in a confident way or can just put all his chips in with a good value hand. So check or bet here wouldn't surprise me. Certainly if he was deeper, I would always bet. Um, and I still think I would bet here, but uh, had he checked, it wouldn't have shocked me. I would actually check in this spot. Yeah. It's one of those weird spots where you have one of the best hands that you don't want to get check-raised with. Yeah. And typically, if you think to yourself, I've got a cool hand here, but I don't want to get check raised, you should probably check, but not always. It's going to depend on the frequency of your opponent and the board right. texture, of course. And that's part of the reason I, I would check there is the board texture. It, it did have a flush draw. There were multiple mm -hmm. straight draw draws. possibilities. So I would be a little yeah. concerned with getting check raised there. And Harrison's the type of capable player who sometimes is going to have gut shots that he turns into a semi bluff and check raises you there. And Correct. as well as going to you know check raise some of his value hands, some of his big combination draws. And, uh, and force Jesse to play a committing pot. What do you think about that fold from under the gun with Queen-10? Four-handed? Yeah. Seems kind of tight. Seems very I tight to me. fold that spot there. And uh, we haven't seen any three bets without really good hands at this final table yet, so it's not as though there's so much action pre-flop that you're scared to get involved. And is there another stack that is anywhere near as short as mm -hmm. Jesse's? So, so the ICM isn't a huge consideration no. in this spot. I'm very surprised to see him fold his queen 10 there. So we have another small blind versus blind confrontation between Harrison and Ravi. Limp and a check. Ravi with just nine high here, fires, takes it down. Fired pretty big there too. Now there's our updated chip counts. Ravi just beneath four million. Three guys really in contention right now, and Jesse Rockowitz, our short stack, but uh, not the type of short stack that he's in any kind of urgent position. He's still got 40 blinds to work with, and our blinds just recently went up, so he can hang out for a while. The first final table that I, I commentated, actually, Jesse Rockowitz uh, won that, and it was a tournament that... Uh, believe it or not, started online, and then we reconvened in a live setting mm -hmm. to finish out the tournament. It was an eye pops eye poker event. Uh, it started with thousands of people, got yep. down to the remaining 27. They flew us out to Barcelona for the final 27. Unfortunately, I, I busted like 16th or something, but I had a chance to to um, commentate uh, Jesse when he won the event. Very cool. What did he win for? How much? It was 100000 up top. Nice. So for a $120 buy-in tournament. Uh, and a know, trip to Barcelona. Not bad. No, not at all. All right, so Harrison here opens up the action with 9-8. Ravi. I think he just 3-bet, right? No, he called. Excuse me. So it seems like Ravi is more call-prone than 3-bet-prone pre-flop. And we've seen a couple times here he has hands in the small blind that might play better to a 3-bet, and yet he's just calling with them. So perhaps we've identified you know, one of the sort of uh, weaknesses in his game, as it were. We have a really interesting flop here. Very cool flop here. Everybody is connected in some way. Harrison with middle pair, Jesse with two over cards and a gut shot, and Ravi, of course, with the ace high flush draw. 
everyone will check. Jack on the turn is going to give the King Jack of Jesse the best hand. But now Harrison has pair and open ender. Another check from Ravi. I'm anticipating a bet from Jesse here because it seems very unlikely that Harrison would bet that card after checking the flop. I don't think he should be too scared of someone raising him. It would be odd. About 40% the size of the pot bet from Jesse here. If you're Harrison, what are you doing with your 9-8? Hmm. Maybe fold, because I don't think I have the best hand, and I think that if I make my draw, sometimes I have the idiot end of the straight and pay off a better hand, and then if I get my, you know, 7, uh, I might not even get paid on it. So I think I ditch it, but he's getting a good price, so I think calling's also fine. Um, I think he might raise too, which is a very viable option. It's tricky because he did raise. He did raise, which is a really interesting raise here. Yeah, you're not repping a lot. I don't think. I guess you maybe you're saying you have something like king queen or. It is possible to check back the flop with seven yeah. eight as well. Yeah, you could do that. I think he would be mo much more likely to see bet eight queen than yeah. seven eight or king even king queen. Yeah. That I think seven eight he would check back on the flop. Um, it's it, an interesting spot where all three options are reasonable. I would have folded. Yeah. I like raising more than calling. Yeah. And it's now, of course, it, it puts Robbie in, a, in an interesting spot here with the nut I think flush Robbie draw. Has to fold. I would be folding if yeah. I were Robbie, but as we've but seen Robbie, Robbie play. Robbie's going to call three ball it. Yes. Oh, wow. Robbie. Look at this. Oh, Robbie, I hope this works for you, and I think it will. I mean, Jesse obviously can't play. Harrison has got to call off another 300,000 with just third pair and a weak open-ended. Jesse lays down the best hand. Yeah, Jesse has to fold there. There's nothing. I mean, if you're in Jesse's position and Harrison raises you, you're giving folding a very serious consideration, let alone Ravi's cold three bet. At this point, Ravi really does rep king-queen, and he can absolutely have it with the line he's taken. Certainly. And Harrison has to be thinking, well, what is what is Ravi going to be bluffing here? Yeah. What, what kind of hands? Of course, the, the hand that Ravi has is one of the few that makes sense. Maybe a flush draw with a queen in it or yeah, a king in it. or a king in it. Do you like Ravi's sizing? Do you maybe think about going a little bit bigger to deter draws? I, I'd go bigger. And Ravi wins the pot. The what software cool engineer hand. from Dublin, California... With the three bet on the turn, taking it down. That was a great hand. So nicely done by the quote-unquote amateur at the table, although he's at his second WPT final table in his many events. Hanging out and I'll tell you what, he may not be a software engineer for too much longer. No. You, if you final table back-to-back -back WPTs and you have the confidence to go in there with two fantastic players and... Three bet the flop there with, with your flush draw and, and your winning pots like that, making final tables. Uh, he should feel pretty good about himself. <coughs> now we have Harrison under the gun with Big Slick here, and he certainly will be opening, probably for 49000 Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Robbie is still smirking about last hand. <laughs> I think I see him just kind of sitting there feeling very content. Over to Taylor. I think he'll defend a 9-7, facing a min raise. I would think both Taylor and Harrison are going to be defending their big blind quite wide. So he makes the call. Both players connect on ace, jack, seven, all spades, but not quite enough here for Taylor to continue if Harrison bets again. I do expect a bet from Harrison. Taylor lets it go. 
Now, what is interesting is that as the final table becomes shorter handed, mm -hmm. defending the big blind becomes actually less of a, of a good right. thing to do because the net antes are actually smaller. That's right. So I could see players, um, the stronger players at the table, getting away from hands that at a nine handed table they, they might defend against a late position open. Uh, whereas here, because there are fewer antes in the pod, they might elect to fold. Uh, certainly wasn't the case this hand with the 9 7. Seems that Twitch is having some problems today, so we'll see if we can't get those worked out for you for the time being. We'll keep the live stream going right here at the WPT. Robbie and Jesse are out. Over to Taylor. Suda Jack in the small. Then he will call. I would expect Taylor to do a lot of calling out of the small blind against Harrison. I don't think he's looking to play many out-of-position bloated pots against an opponent who's not going to give up very frequently. Both players with jack high here. Oh, excuse me, Taylor has flop bottom pair, and he has a backdoor flush draw. I think his bet is fine here. He shouldn't expect his opponent to bluff too frequently. I mean, it's one of those bets where, you know, you can't make a better hand fold. You can't get a worse hand to call. Maybe you're just trying to keep your opponent from, you know, getting a free look at, uh, you know, what, whatever he has. You know, 8-10 offsuit, 8-6 offsuit, where he can just turn a pair and get you. Um, that's one of those spots where betting and checking both have their merits, but I often end up betting because I think I have more equity than he does. I think I would have checked in that yeah. spot, but... Just allow allow your opponent to, to bluff if if he does have less equity than you. Well, guys, we want to remind you that on our partner DraftKings, there's a big March Madness tournament tomorrow. We don't get too many big tournaments for college basketball, but we are going to have one tomorrow on DraftKings. It is a 150k guarantee with a $20 buy-in. It is the March Mania Cinderella. And there will be hundreds of thousands of prizes available for college basketball over the next two weeks. And, of course, we also have the Masters coming up. There is the 2.2 million Fantasy Golf Millionaire Maker on April 9th. That is going to be a huge tournament. I don't know anything about golf, and I'm going to have some entries in that one. That's a $20 buy-in. It needs 125,000 entries to fill. This is a huge tournament. Wow. Uh, and that's only got 11,000, just almost 12,000 right now. And I'm sure that will... Uh, approach the mark in the coming weeks, but it will. I, I would be surprised if that thing filled up. So a good opportunity to get in some overlay if you know your golf or you just want to fire in some guys, sit back with your, uh, your friends and family and watch the tournament with a little money riding on it. That's a great way to do it. And of course, a big month of basketball coming up. So get in on the action on DraftKings. Here we have an interesting uh, pot where Jesse opened under the gun with 33 big blinds, the King Jack offsuit, and Robbie has defended the big blind, so it seems as though Harrison and Taylor will not be the only players defending their big blind wide with King 4 offsuit, and the flop goes check check on a King 5 7 monotone board. So we have seen Jesse now check back top pair twice. Uh, so far at this final table. He did in the first hand of the final table with the ace 10, now he's doing it with the King Jack. What do you think about him checking back the flop there? I like it here because the monotone flop creates an awkward scenario where you can't just go bet, bet, bet confidently, and you can't bet and get check raised and feel confident about it, but you have a hand that's good enough where if it goes check, check, and the turn is a heart, you're going to call at least one street, maybe two, definitely one, um, and if you get a safe card, such as a seven of clubs, you're going to be able to bet twice confidently. Um, I suppose if he goes bet and then Ravi calls and the river is a heart, he's going to have something to think about. Uh, but on many runouts, you're going to be able to bet confidently twice. Yeah, I would not be betting a heart on the river. Yeah, I would have. I would have see bet. The fl I think your hand is strong enough to to see bet on this board. Mm -hmm. But I certainly don't mind the check back. I think this is much closer than than the ace ten that he checked back earlier. But it does seem like Jesse does like to check back some of his stronger hands on the flop mm -hmm. and. Ravi, of course, makes a call with King-4. For what it's worth, Gain, I would definitely bet that flop in cash. And mm -hmm. I think in this particular tournament scenario, there's a little more merit to checking. But it's also a spot where, again, both options are quite reasonable. So a 5 on the river. 
Doesn't really change much here. Puts two por a two pair on the board. And look at this lead from Robbie here on the river. That's pretty big too. I want to say 175. Wow. Is, is so it's kind of a merge bet in a way. I think that Robbie is value betting yes, here, trying I agree. to trying to look like he has a busted heart. I think it's a weird spot to bet that large. I don't think there's a lot of reason to bet that big. Yeah, it is. It is. It is a strange bet. I don't. I don't know what I would have done against that bet on the river, though, with a hand like pocket tens. Um, I probably would have folded. So, it probably was too big of a bet for what he was doing. And and Jesse wins a, a nice size pot there. Jesse's fiance Sheena is watching at home, cheering him on, as are his parents, watching the live stream here and. One thing that uh, Jesse is very appreciative of is the support that he gets from, from his parents and from his fiance. Always, always there for him and always cheering him on. Taylor here with King 7 under the gun. Harrison with a pretty fun hand here on the button, the Queen Ten of Hearts. He elects to just call. Would you have been three betting here in this spot? You know, it's interesting, Kane. It, it's one of those hands where you can call or raise. If you're raise, you're essentially uh, taking a linear strategy against Taylor where you're saying, okay, I'm going to take my best hands, particularly in position, and just raise them for value, even though Queen-10 is not a hand that's just going to win at showdown unimproved that often. It's a hand that connects with a lot of boards, gives you opportunities to win big pots, gives you an opportunity to semi-bluff with some draws. Um, I probably wouldn't because Taylor doesn't seem like the kind of guy who calls re-raises out of position with weaker hands. And so against those type of players, those are the ones I'm going to get linear against and slide more hands like Queen-10 suited, Jack-10 suited, Queen-Jack suited into my 3-betting for value range. Whereas against Taylor, who I think is going to play fairly raise-fold pre-flop unless he's got stronger hands out of position, I think the call is fine. You? I, I would have 3-bet. You would have 3-bet? I would have 3-bet. Also, because calling does give Jesse an opportunity to enter the pot from the big blind. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that Taylor is opening wide enough to justify a, a you know, three-bet bluff here with the with the queen-10, or yep. at least a three-bet where you're, you want to win the pot pre-flop. And it's always nice to have hands where you three-bet, and if your opponent makes some kind of weird small four-bet, you can go to a flop and flop tons of equity. What is interesting, though, is that Harrison seems to be quite comfortable playing post-flop, and, you know, he's a player where most of his experience is in tournaments, um, but it, it does seem like he's looking to, to take on spots where he is seeing flops and turns, and now we have a, a pretty interesting spot here where Taylor elects to check-raise this board. He's essentially repping over pairs. This would he really check raise an over pair? I don't know about that though. Against two opponents, I don't know that he would. I don't think this is terribly plausible. It might be a spot where it doesn't matter too much because it's such an uncoordinated board that Harrison's going to bet a ton and doesn't have enough equity to peel with against a check raise. So maybe it's a good play for those reasons. But I never like bluffs where we're repping a very thin range. This is certainly not what I expected. Uh, Taylor has a hand that really can't improve unless he hits a king. Harrison does make the call. Now, do you think that Taylor is is planning on firing multiple streets here? Ah. Uh, on blanks. It's pretty heroic. Just a, a stone-cold no-equity bluff-off when your opponent 
could conceivably have a five and probably won't fold many of his tens. I mean, how many fives though are not are, many? Like he's five suited. That's or what anything, makes so. it. A, that's what makes it an interesting spot. Taylor does check. I, yeah. I, I may have preferred his flop check raise if he was planning on unloading the clip. To be honest, yeah. simply because really the best hand that his opponent can show up with on the river is ace ten. Um, even ace ten is probably more of a three bet hand. So king ten. Um, of course, he can have a couple of random fives. But we did see Harrison earlier fold the 9-7 suited on the button, so whether or not he would be calling preflop with the 5-6 suited or the 4-5 suited is questionable. So both players check the turn. I like Harrison checking behind there. Um, you could bet, but I don't think you're really getting value from anything, so... I think that had to be a mistake in our graphics. You saw the ace there too for a second. Yeah, that we saw the board. We we, we can be pretty confident that uh, that's not the case. There it is. There's the, the There's true the, board. the true board. So I think Taylor's flop check raise was had to be. He was just stabbing one street, and it, it could be because he thought that Harrison was more likely than average to just bet that that board with air when check two. Based on what I've seen from Harrison so far, though, I don't believe that to be the case. I've actually, we've seen Harrison so far uh, simply check fold and not really play back or get too creative with his no equity type hands. Mm -hmm. What what was the river there, Tony? A deuce. And it went check, check. Yeah, Harrison won. I, I would have bet. I would have bet in Harrison's yeah. position at that point. I'm just real confident I have the best hand. I mean, even though there's not a lot of worse hands that can call you, there's value to your opponent not getting to see your hand, and it's just so hard for him to be better than you. So I'd feel pretty okay, and I, I probably wouldn't bet that big either. I don't think you have to be too afraid of like betting the river and getting check raised for some strange reason. Maybe he maybe he was afraid of king ten or ace ten. That could be a thing. It's not an unreasonable line to take in Taylor's position with King 10, Ace 10. Right. The problem with betting is is that... What's worse that calls you? What's worse that calls you? And also, what bluffs do you have on the 5, 5, 10 board betting and calling a raise? Um, and checking back the turn. I mean, even if you were on a pure float, you would have bluffed the turn, you know? So... And Taylor has a, the same hand in the big blind that he defended last time. He has the 9-7 offsuit. Harrison with the king deuce of clubs. We're going to see a flop here. 5-6-7 five, five, of diamonds. And Taylor does have the 9 of diamonds and the 7 of hearts, so he does have the straight flush draw. And 8 of diamonds would make him the straight flush. He checks to Harrison, and Harrison quickly checks back. Queen of clubs on the turn. Taylor here, almost certainly going to bet, and Harrison not going to continue. He will let it go. Taylor Parr inching closer to being a back-to-back -back WPT champion. And, Tony, you were discussing this earlier. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are the odds? You know, in the history of the WPT, we haven't had a repeat champion, uh, with the exception of somebody who did it over two seasons. Correct. Correct. Now, all of a sudden, in the same season, we have two, and we're going for a third. Mind-blowing. It's crazy. Yeah, it really is. Ravi here with ace seven. First to act, I expect him to raise it up. He seems like a guy who looks for reasons to play hands more so than looks for reasons to fold them. Yeah. He is going up to 54. Jesse with uh, about 40 bigs behind him and eight six suited.
I think that was a 3-bet, right? And we were talking before about 3-betting the hand such as 9-7 suited in position. He's taken an opportunity to do with 8-6 suited here. But I'll say this, Kane. I don't like this one as much, partially because Jesse has a shorter stack, and partially because from what I've seen from Ravi, I think he's more likely to peel out of position than the two professional players uh, on the table. I think that is true. At, yeah. the sa at the same point in time, Jesse has been pretty tight he has. at this final table. I don't mind the spot at all. I, in fact, probably would have three bet as well with the with eight six of diamonds in the spot. But we'll see. Ravi has not. He's been reluctant to fold, so yeah. Ravi might make it real tough for Jesse here, but. We'll see what happens. Um, Jesse also has a lot of post-flop experience. He, he's a uh, very talented online uh, tournament and cash game player. Uh, he was known as Deuces85 online. And he and I have actually played a lot together at uh, ring games on, on Poker Stars. And he probably feels like he has an edge post-flop on, on Robbie, who's a recreational player. And he's going to take a spot here, but <laughs> Ravi relentlessly re-raises. Ravi with a four bet here, perhaps sensing weakness from Jesse. Wow. Ravi's really surprising us. He's in it to he? win it. He is in it to win it. I'll Good tell you him. what. After coming from Bay 101 and getting six, maybe he had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder <laughs> about like, that. Or maybe he was like, you know what? I've already made one of these final tables, and now it's time to win one. And if I've got to while out a little bit and start swinging, then so be it. I mean, what can Jesse do? Now, do you think that Robbie's four bet? They think Robbie is thinking here. You know, I have an ace blocker. This is a good hand to four bet. Or do you think Robbie is just Showed thinking I'm not going to be, I'm um, not going to be shoved around? I know? just don't know enough about Robbie to think which thought process is probably appealing to him. I do trust that he looked at his opponent's stack size and said, I can make a four bet here, and you have to make a million chip decision, whereas I only have to risk 350k. Right. Which is cool. The software engineer from Dublin, California, just running over this final table so far. Of course, it does help to get aces against kings, but we've seen him make some very creative plays with hands that were were not the best hand, or at least when faced in very tough spots. Uh, the a6 of spades was a very interesting hand that both you and I agreed we would have folded in that spot. Um, but Robbie just being relentlessly aggressive. Now Harrison has the... 8-6 offsuit in the small blind, and he has been limping all of his small blinds so far when it was folded around. And something to be noted from that is that Taylor is actually folding quite a few buttons. It has gotten heads up to, to Harrison and Robbie's small blind quite a bit. So Taylor probably knows that having played with Robbie at the Bay 101, that Robbie does not like to fold a small blind, or his big blind, and also does not like to fold post-flop, and yeah. maybe that's why he's folding a few more buttons I than, would, than an he otherwise would. I like, yeah. you know? So Harrison here, flops, two pair, 10-10-8. Bets once, takes it down. Right, Taylor here with rags. Harrison going to open it up with a six. So, looking over the chip counts, Robbie is in first with 175 big blinds, over 4 million in chips, and then Harrison and, and Taylor Parr are both pretty close. Yep. Um, and then, of course, Jesse, 
bringing up the rear of the remaining four players with just 36 big blinds, 860,000 chips, which is a little more chips than he started the final table with, but he right now is certainly the short stack, and the other three players are going to be pretty... They're going to be unlikely to put all their chips in the middle uh, with the ability to move up so easily in the pay jump here. Now we have Ravi on the button with 8-9 offsuit. He will be raising. So he does, in fact, raise. Jesse out. Taylor lets go jack six. And Ravi will take it. We were talking a little bit before about why the Chris Borland retirement was such big news out of San Francisco. He's a 24-year-old player, uh, a great college player at Wisconsin, and uh, was a, a rookie who exceeded expectations. He got drafted in the third round. Um, Patrick Willis, the starting linebacker in, uh, in San Francisco, went down, so he got a whole bunch of playing time, really excelled, and then he went and did a bunch of homework during the offseason about the uh, lasting consequences of concussions and what they're calling CTE, which uh, it turns out a lot of NFL players develop after their career, which is a degenerative brain disease that seems to cause, you know, dementia, depression, uh, some violence in cases, and, uh, you know, people are wondering, is this going to be a turning point in NFL history where a lot of players and even top players uh, choose to walk away or walk away much earlier than they would have because of their concern over those risks? I, in general, can't see that being the case. I, I think this is an exception. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's interesting that he's he's chosen to dedicate so much of his life to to this sport, and yep. he just now has made that decision. And yeah. certainly, to to come, there has been more information coming out recently about about uh, about the negative long term effects that that can have on you, and that certainly does play a role. But I would imagine that this is going to be an exception rather than the rule moving forward. I agree with you, but I also think that the more we learn about this, the more you might see NFL players walking away, not necessarily at the age of 24, but even, you know, Patrick Willis retired this season at mm -hmm. 29 or 30 at the end of the season. A couple of other guys, uh, Jake Locker retired at 26. There was another linebacker, w Worldist or something like that, who retired at 27. I think we mar might start seeing guys who play for a few years, play well, start to feel the, the toil on their, the toll on their body, and, uh, and then choose to walk away. Um, I wouldn't be worried about a mass exodus from football. There's so many people still interested, and obviously it's very lucrative to play for a living if you get to the professional level. But I, I wouldn't be surprised to see more of a trend of guys calling it quits earlier in their career instead of trying to last it out for a 10-year-plus 10, 10 career. Right. Well, it, it should be noted that the NFL has taken steps mm -hmm. to reduce the risks involved. Right. As specifically, I mean, if you look at the way that football was played, you know, 40 years ago. It is a completely different game. It's a much safer game. Yes. And I think the NFL will continue to take those steps uh, moving forward. So specifically, if more things like this happen, the NFL will respond by continuing to make it a safer game. Um, but I think the fans are kind of at odds with that idea. A lot of fans don't want the game to change. And no. I certainly understand that side of the argument as well. But here we have a, a pretty interesting pot yeah, boiling do. where Robbie has opened the ace nine of spades and, and Taylor uh, three bet the king eight of hearts and got called by Robbie. He bet the flop and Robbie called on the flop and now they're seeing a turn and it's a great okay. turn for Robbie. He now has trip nines. Robbie very quickly checks behind. Do not like it. Yeah, not on that kind of coordinated board and in a situation where you're You've already got a pretty large pot built up. Your hand is somewhat disguised. Um, yeah, I, I don't understand that one. But he might get Taylor to bet again here. I don't think he will, um, just because the board has ran out and run out in such a way that you know he can't plausibly represent many hands. Oh, I was wrong. I'm a little surprised to see Taylor betting. I'm here. surprised to see him betting as yeah. well. Is he going to get called or raised, King? Depends on what the bet size is. Let's see. Snap here. called. <laughs> yes. Just it turns call. out to be the answer. Snap called and cards revealed. <laughs> um, and it wasn't. It was about half pot. Two sixty-five. Yeah. I I would have I would have raised if I were Robbie. Yeah.
That was kind of an odd hand. It was an odd river bet by, by Taylor. I'm not sure what he was trying to fold out. Because mm -hmm. I don't think you're even getting things like, you know, king, jack, queen, jack to fold there. No. So. Especially not for that size. Yeah. I, I would be really interested to hear his thought process there. You're getting, like, eights and to fold? I mean, you, you're obviously going yeah. to get uh, queen x or king x to fold, but you're ahead of those hands anyway. Um, so if it goes check, check, you're going to win at showdown. I'm... I'm I'm surprised by that bet. Taylor okay. going to raise up this button with 7-6 off. And Harrison Gimmel with a fun hand here in the small blind. Okay, we return to your three bet or call question, Kay. Yeah, Queen of Hearts. I would be three betting here. Yeah. And Harrison does does not three bet. He elects to simply call. Harrison has not three bet one hand at this final table, has he? I don't think so. I don't I don't remember any three bets. It seems like Harrison is, is seems to be playing much more straightforward fit or fold than I would have expected. Um, which there's certainly merit to that when there are ICM considerations at a final table against tough opponents, uh, specifically against somebody like Robbie who who may be putting in some chips. Um, with some speculative hands in certain spots, but we do have one exception to that, which is when he actually raised Jesse Rockowitz's bet with the 9-8 on the turn and ended up losing that pot to, to Robbie. What a strange hand for Robbie to lead out with, huh? Very strange. Very strange. And now, it, now, if you're Taylor here with the gut shot, what are you doing? I guess I fold because there's another player behind me. My hand's not that good, and I don't know what to make of Ravi's lead, but... I would fold. Yeah. I, Taylor keeps surprising me. Wow, Taylor Taylor raises in this yeah, spot. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay, it's I, very I thought, surprising. I thought he had called. No. Wow, so this this makes it a, a really tough spot for, for Harrison. Harrison. Who I'm guessing will fold? I, I would fold know. here. Yeah, I would fold. Then again, these players have been playing with, with Robbie for the past couple days. They If they have some type of idea that he's leading the 9-5 offsuit on this board then it completely changes the hand. It completely changes the frequency with which Taylor's going to raise him, and therefore it changes the frequency with which um, with which Harrison should be calling there. I like that Taylor has determined that Ravi leading such an uncoordinated texture is unlikely to be a good hand. So perhaps the, you know raising a hand like 7-6 with a gut shot here is exactly the type of hand he should be using for those plays, but... Um, now I wouldn't be surprised if yeah. Ravi if Ravi three bet the flop here to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> Fluff me, will you? <laughs> <laughs> and he's gonna let this one go. So Taylor semi bluffing with the gut shot gets Harrison to fold top pair. And it's interesting how off, how many times so far at this final table the best hand has folded. Jesse had to lay down the king the king jack. Harrison just had to lay down the jack queen top pair. And I mean these these players are are playing aggressively. That's for sure. Hasn't been a boring final table at all. And we're seeing some really thoughtful poker, too, and, and some surprising plays. You know, these guys are doing some things that we did not anticipate them to do.
Taylor with ace deuce under the gun gonna open it up. So we have a little answer from the Twitterverse about what Ravi's mentality today. Todd Graham says, on the money bubble, Ravi was tested for his turning life by Ari Angle, who four bet shove, and Ravi called with Ace King declaring, I'm here to win. So if we see him mixing it up and getting a little aggressive today, that might be an insight as to why. He is not he doesn't care about moving up in yeah. the in the places and the money, but he's he's in it to win it. I mean, after taking sixth in the last one, in the last uh, Bay one oh one shooting star WPT. He uh, he has a, a little he has a little taste of glory, and this time he wants to be able to close it out. He wants all the glory, <laughs> all of it. And I will say this: right now, he is the most glorious player on this final table. He has certainly has been so far. That cold three bet, glorious. And that that four bet pre flop mm -hmm. against Jesse. Yeah. With the a seven. I wonder if Taylor, Jesse, and. Uh, and Harrison are going to be fed the hands from our live stream, and I expect they'll have somebody communicating them to them, and uh, then adjust against Ravi, because I uh, I don't know if Ravi, being less experienced with poker, is as conscious of things like a live stream or getting all the information, or if one of, he's one of those guys that's like, okay, I got my game plan, I'm just going to go in there, I don't want a bunch of new information okay. screwing with me. I mean, we just don't know too much about this guy. Um, but I would think if, you know... Taylor or Harrison gets a sense that he is just going to come out there swinging and they find out that he's doing things like cold three betting the six suited, you know, four betting uh, the a seven off, uh, leading out the nine five zero. Oh, that they're going to widen their ranges and maybe that's why we saw Taylor do what he did with the seven six. What would be your primary adjustment if you were being fed the live stream? If you were Taylor, for example, and, and you are being fed the live stream, you do have the hands. Mm -hmm. How are you going to play differently with knowing what Robbie is capable of. When I have showdown value, I'm going to call him down lighter because normally when I've got a guy on the table who's among the less experienced, I anticipate him to be more passive as a default, and that's not what we're seeing out of Robbie at all. And then sometimes when I have that borderline equity where I don't have quite a calling hand, um, but I'm unsure whether I should raise or fold, I'm going to start to lean a little more towards raise like we saw with the 7 6. Right. I also would be playing tighter pre flop, quite a bit so. Uh, when there's somebody like this at my table, especially when it's forehand, when he's one of the four players at the table, I tend to really, I like to be in spots where I can make strong hands and, and kind of call him down. Mm -hmm. So hands like the 8-6 of diamonds certainly become less of a 3-bet against him, obviously, once you know he's capable of 4-betting the, the A-7 offsuit. Again, in, in that instance, I, I would have done the same thing as Jesse in 3-bet, and I would have, like Jesse, had to fold, and I think that's a way that you can adjust moving forward once you're fed that information. Harrison Gimmel here, the player at the table with the most live tournament earnings. He has over $3 million in live tournament earnings. Now, most of that was the 2010 PCA, as we had discussed earlier, that tournament was for $2.2 million. That was a big PCA that year, and he was only 19 at the time. Man, that's <laughs> such a huge win to have at that age, and it can really uh, go to your head. You might make some bad financial decisions. You might start playing tournaments that you don't really belong in, and it seems that Harrison has avoided all of that stuff. Yeah. What would you have done with $2.2 million at 19, Tony? Something really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know at 19. I mean, I'm trying to think how much money I had to my name at 19. Maybe like a couple thousand dollars in my party poker account. Um, maybe. I can remember when I was... I had just turned... I had just turned 20. Uh, my sophomore year. And I had like $2,800 in my party poker account when I won a 13K package down to Australia. And that was like earth-shattering for me. I thought this was the greatest thing that had ever happened to me and would ever happen to me. So I think if you gave me $2.2 .2 million, I would have done some dumb, dumb stuff. <laughs> Jesse here on the button. Flops top pair with the queen. Harrison here in the big blind. Doesn't really connect. He could still peel this just because it's an uncoordinated texture. He has a backdoor flush draw and his opponent is going to see bet quite wide, but it wouldn't shock me if he just folds too. From what I've seen yeah. from Harrison, I, I would expect him to, to fold here. 
and he folds pretty quickly. Yeah. Jesse takes the pot down, and I would say that Jesse, of the remaining four players, is the best dressed at this final table. I would agree. He's got buttons. <laughs> Now those are our payouts, as you can see, 268 up top. As like we were talking about earlier, the payout jumps for the first three players eliminated are fairly small. Something that is interesting is three out of the four players at this final table who are remaining live within an hour and 15 minutes of here. The only one who does not is Harrison, who lives in Florida, in the Miami area. He's a big Miami sports fan. He is a big Miami sports fan. He had, like, every team in the Miami area listed on his bio sheet. Jesse here with a pair of sevens. Taylor, 9-10 suited right behind him. I assume we'll flat call. These days, it's not the easiest thing in the world to be a Miami sports fan. No. Uh, you know what, though? The, the Heat are, are not that bad. They've got Goran Dragic now. Uh, Hassan Whiteside came out of nowhere to be a phenomenal player. Uh, Dwayne Wade has somehow reversed time. It's really crappy for them that uh, Bosch got knocked out with a season-ending injury. But if he hadn't, I think that Miami would be one of the best teams in the East. Are you expecting them to make any type of a run? I expect them to get out of the first round of the playoffs. I'm the, I don't know exactly where they're falling right now. Maybe they're like the five seed or something, but I could just be totally wrong about that. Um, but they've got a pretty good squad there right now. And uh, for having lost LeBron and, and you know, immediately been counted out of the, the championship equation. I think they're in better shape than people would have expected. Now here's here's Robbie and he does have a pair. So he likes to call you, this is a three bet pot. It is, I, right. I wasn't really expecting Taylor to three bet this hand because Jesse's at that stack size where he might just cram over a three bet. I think I would rather just flat in Taylor's position with ten nine suited, wouldn't you? Wow, so Robbie is, is calling now and now this if you're now if you're Jesse, you started the hand with 35 big blinds. I'd be really tempted to just cram because I think Ravi peels these situations a little too light. I do think Taylor's going to try and pick on me some. I've got a hand that doesn't play that well post-flop out of position in a three-way pot, but if I get called pre-flop, I'm going to be racing a bunch. Um, would Now, would cram. you shove or would you make it a, a would you four bet to a size that looks stronger? I would cram because if I'm four bet small, Ravi might peel something like queen jack. Correct. Know, uh, so... That makes sense. Yeah, I like a shove here too. There's, and, and he Jesse's does go all in. in, and I like that. There's 320,000 yeah. in the pot. He's investing 790 to win that. That's one of the first plays I've seen from Taylor that I really don't like. I thought that he was in a really good position to just flat call pre-flop, and that Jesse has a stack size that plays to an open four bet jam pretty naturally. Do you think Robbie might call? He surprised me before. I don't think he would be a good call, but he certainly could. I can't imagine he's going to call here. Robbie would need about 39, slightly over 39% equity in order to profitably make a call here. And he does lay it down, yeah. and he shows, he shows the ducks. I'm not sure if that's really information he wants to be giving away, yeah. that he that he is flatting out of the big blind with the pocket deuces. But cold flatting three bets. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, that's the real problem, yeah. giving that away. If you just if you had called a raise and then turned over, hey, I had deuces, everyone's like, well, yeah. Okay. Of course, of course. yeah. Uh, when he shows that he's cold calling three bets that wide, next time Jesse is in a position like he was there with kind of a marginal hand to jam with, he's going to feel much more confident about it. But as you can see, our players are about to go on break. Guys, we will see you in what is either 10 or 15 minutes. I'm not sure how long the breaks are, but we'll be back soon.